All righty. Wow, this is a, uh, a more packed room than I expected, considering the uh, little bit of uh, news at the end of the keynote there. I expected that all you guys would be downstairs right now, but thanks for coming anyway. Um, so my name is Dan Morrill. Um, I'm with Google Dev Developer Relations, and I'm here today to... Uh, you know, give you this presentation on how do I code the let me count the ways. And really the point here is to illustrate to you guys um, the various ways that you can build applications on Android. So, you know, let's get, let, let's get started and get right into it. So the first question I want to answer is what is Android? Um, well, you know, at the bottom of Android we have the Linux kernel. And this is essentially what we use for our hardware abstraction layer. And this is where all the device drivers live and so on. Um, above that we have the native libraries for things like media you know what? This isn't what I want to do today, because I think we've used this slide at every single presentation that we've ever done. I think it's time to put this thing out to pasture and move on. So let me start over again. What is Android? Well, I want to make today the case that Android is really three things. Uh, the first is uh, a chunk of code for making phone calls. I owned one of those things. It was an awesome phone back in the day. Um, and when I say it's a chunk of code for making phone calls, what I really mean is you know, originally cell phones had only enough software to read input and drive the radio stack to place a phone call, you know, single function devices and so on. And of course, you know, obviously Android as a, you know, mobile phone stack has exactly that capability as well. So it's a chunk of code for making calls. Uh, Android is also, you know, a robust network stack and internet client. And I remember, oh, I don't even know, like five or more years ago, there was this TV commercial for one of the big carriers. Um, and it had a woman who had a brand new cell phone and she was very proud of it. And she was bragging about her new phone to, to you know, a friend or something like that. And the conversation went on for a moment until somebody asked a question that she couldn't answer. And the friend says, oh, well, I'll just get my phone out and search the internet for it. And uh, I remember this commercial because the woman said in this dejected, like the most plaintive voice you can imagine, you can get the internet on your phone? And it was, I just laughed out loud when I saw it. Not because it was funny, but because to me, it's like that's something that I was already expecting even five years ago. And so, you know, today, you know, Android has a robust network stack and internet client. You know, we've got a state-of-the-art web browser, uh, you know, and, uh, and a full TCP, TCP IP stack. And, of course, the third thing, and, and really the thing that I want to talk about most today, is Android is a platform for running code. Let me talk about that a bit more. What do I mean by running code? Well, Android has an application model of its own. You guys are probably familiar or have heard of the Dalvik virtual machine and, you know, made available to Dalvik as a variety of core framework APIs and so on. Um, but, you know, I love reading the press because people, even today, will still print things like, oh, you know, Google's looking to extend its dominance to cell phone. And, and that, isn't, that really isn't what Android is about. We created Android to be the open mobile platform that we needed. You know, and so from that perspective, we don't really necessarily care, per se, how you guys build your applications. We built the, the APIs uh, that run in Dalvik to be an intentionally uh, loosely coupled, and I like to describe them as a federation of components, but basically what that means is that your application consists of components you write as well as component, or components that you pull in from other uh, applications that are installed on the device. Um, and so, you know, those components can include the web. And they can, you know, you know also include aspects of native code if you want to write uh, code that way as well. In other words, you know, basically we just love code. Android is about letting developers get their apps into users' hands on a mobile device however, you know, it works best for you. Uh, and so, you know, in other words, you know, we welcome all code from, you know, from anywhere. And, yeah, I, I, I made this SVG myself. You can probably tell. Um, but, yeah, you know, really we want to liberate your code and give you guys the, the openness and freedom that you need to build applications. So all that said, that's, my, that's the tone of what I want to talk about today. So this is my agenda. You know, what I'm going to do is I'm going to demonstrate to you guys three ways of writing code, kind of the three key ways of writing code for Android. I'm going to demonstrate how to use them. So I'm going to actually, you know, show you some code and so on. And then towards the end, I'm also going to draw some conclusions, uh, give you some useful comparisons and statistics, um, and, uh, you know, that you guys can use when you're making your own decisions about application architecture. Throughout, I'm also going to, you know, give you guys a, a taste of the roadmap and, and some of the features that are coming. Uh, I do want to take another moment to explain what I'm not going to cover. I'm going to assume that everybody here either already knows how to build... Uh, you know, a Dalvik application for Android or knows how to build an Ajax application. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about the basics of app development. There's documentation online. There's, uh, you know, other sessions that you can go to uh, today and tomorrow to cover all that. Um, the other thing I'm not going to do is pass judgment. I'm not going to give you a pat answer. I'm not going to give you, you know, kind of a, 
you know, magic solution or an equation that you solve for that tells you the right way to build your application. My real aim here is to arm you guys with the knowledge that you need to make your own informed decisions about app development. So, you know, uh, without further ado, let's get into it. So, uh, what are the three flavors uh, of Android development? Well, first is native code, which runs on, as I've alluded to before, a Dalvik virtual machine. Uh, this is a virtual machine on the same order of, you know, a Java virtual machine or a .NET CLR. It's a virtual machine that runs some bytecode. Uh, the second way is Ajax, um, who I believe is a, the guy on the left. Uh, and Ajax is essentially a technique for making uh, dynamic uh, user interfaces in a web browser, typically um, also talking to the network and, and communicating to the server for, for data operations. And then the third kind is native code, which in the current uh, builds of Android includes support for the ARM uh, processor written in uh, C code. So let me then, <clears throat> excuse me, jump into a bit more detail about Dalvik. Um, but wait, I actually need an example. Um, so what I want to do today is I've just described three different ways of writing code. What I'm actually going to do is write the same app all three ways, um, essentially the same app using all three techniques. And so to do this, I need kind of a sample or, or guinea pig algorithm to show you guys how this works and, and have an apples to apples comparison. It needs to be externally uh, or efficiently externalizable and it has to make for an interesting uh, demonstration. I'm not just gonna show you guys um, uh, you know, some things without pretty pictures as well. So this is just a text of what I'm going to describe on the next slide. So what I'm gonna do today, and this is a shout out to my friend and colleague, Kelly Norton, who when I kind of whined about needing an algorithm, the first words out of his mouth were k-means clustering. And so I looked it up and I'm like, ah, yes, that's perfect. Um, but what it is, is essentially it's a, it's, a, it's a member of an algorithm family that Google actually uses a lot internally for, um, you know, machine learning style things where we're, you know, doing some text processing and so on. So it's apropos uh, to Google. And the way it works is uh, you see up there, uh, there's a number of gray squares and then some colored uh, red dots. The gray squares are data points and they're essentially distributed, you know, however your data is distributed. Uh, the way k-means works is basically you have one mean point, which is the circles, associated with every cluster that you want to create. So in, in the example depicted here, which came from Wikipedia, um, there are actually um, three groups, uh, red, green, and blue, and they're clustering those uh, 12 gray points into the three groups. So the algorithm is actually very simple. All you do is compute which mean every point is closest to and associate it with that cluster. Then you, after you've done all of that, you iterate over the uh, groups again, and you recompute the centroid or you know, the mean or the average or the center point of each cluster based on all the new, as the average of all the new members in the group. And this is a greedy algorithm. You keep running it until it converges or until you decide to stop. So that's the algorithm that I'm going to implement. <clears throat> um, and, uh, you know, as you can see here on the right, I don't think, yeah, there's kind of a big uh, black area in the upper left corner. Um, that's actually a, a dark blue color. So sorry for, for the low visibility on that. But as you can see, it's, it's essentially just plots each of the, of the points according to which group it is in uh, by a color coding scheme. Okay, so now back to Dalvik. So um, Dalvik is a virtual machine, uh, as I mentioned earlier. And so um, it's similar to the .NET uh, CLR or a Java virtual machine. It's memory protected, garbage collected, lifecycle managed, and so on. <clears throat> it's optimized for embedded machines, though, uh, meaning that you know, one of the reasons why uh, we didn't just adopt, you know, say, a Java virtual machine for Android is because the stack model uh, that a Java virtual machine defines introduces a lot of overhead when you're running on a, you know, a register-based processor and so on. Um, and so for that reason, we have a custom bytecode format, uh, and the tool chain includes a converter that translates uh, to Dalvik bytecode from, from Java bytecode. Um, so how do you write an app on Dalvik? Well, generally, um, you just write Java source code. Uh, it goes through that compilation and translation phase, and... Um, you know, you make use of the framework APIs that are provided by the system, and that's things like um, the, the view hierarchy and, uh, you know, network access and so on. Um, the APIs that need to be are backed by native code, meaning that, <clears throat> uh, you know, like OpenGL, uh, inter-process communication and so on, these all punch down into native code um, out of Dalvik to do the actual work. Uh, and so, you know, we do support the popular development tools. That's one of the reasons why we went out of our way to include support for the Java language, uh, and we have an Eclipse plugin available, which you know, we have a screenshot of that running there. Um, so what can you do with Dalvik? Well, the, the, the key thing with Dalvik is that you can do rich clients with it. It's, it's the richest 
a form of app development on Android. Um, you can do, you know, you have full control over the user interface. You can uh, run code in the background. You can share components either from other applications that you use yourself, or you can export components that other applications can use. Uh, you have the option to do tight integration with system events and UI. But again, I'm not going to cover all this in detail because there's other sessions that you can go to and you can check our online docs. So, you know, the other thing I want to cover is, well, what can you not do? What are the limitations of Dalvik? And, you know, currently not much. You know, we've built Android so that Dalvik is the primary, um, you know, execution environment. It's the crossroads, if you will, of, of all the other components that, um, you know, that I'll describe later. And that's really quite literal. It is a crossroads. Um, I don't expect you to understand what that means, though, but by the end of the session, after I've gone through all the demos, I think you guys will, will understand what I mean when I say crossroads. Of course, that doesn't necessarily mean that it's the right thing for every application out there. If you're writing an application that's performance intensive and you need a lot of speed, um, you know, sometimes it may make sense, and I'll just foreshadow here, to use native code for that. Um, in other cases, if you're just building sort of an adjunct to a website and you just want a mobile presence, you know, you may not need things like tight integration and background processing. And in that case, it may make sense to go ahead and use uh, an Ajax app for that. So let me uh, stop, you know, talking and, and showing slides for just a moment and, and jump out to Eclipse and uh, do a quick demo for you. So here I have Eclipse um, with the uh, Android plugin ADT installed. And the first thing I'm going to do is import an existing project um, in my demo directory. And so this is some code that I wrote. <clears throat> and I have a quick error that I have to correct. Oh, okay, good, I recompiled it away. Um, so yeah, this is my project. Now, um, the first thing that I want to start with is, you know, this, this one class here called k-means activity. Um, as you can see, this is very simple. Um, all this is essentially doing, if you're not super familiar with Android development, all this is really doing is it's describing the creation of a single screen, you know, that takes up my, uh, my phone's display. And it, it essentially defines that this layout that I've defined in an XML file is, is what I should display in that screen. So if you look at that uh, XML file, which I'll open over here, um, and could just go to the XML view, you can see that the entire view itself is also very simple and consists of this uh, k-means view class that I wrote. Okay, so let's look at that view class. Um, this class has down here a bunch of boilerplate for handling, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, surface changes, so like the screen resizes or the device reorients or something like that. Um, but really the magic happens up here. And what I'm doing is I'm creating this class called k-means thread. Now, if you want more detail on what this, on what's exactly is going on here, this is based on the Lunar Lander uh, demo in the SDK sample code. So you can check that out for a more kind of robust example of, of how animation works. Uh, but it's adapted from that, and really all I'm doing is I'm passing it uh, a, a new thread, two arguments. One is this holder object, which is a handle to a canvas so that the thread can do its own drawing directly into that surface. But the other thing is this uh, class here called the Dalvik Clusterer. So let's look at that. Um, Dalvik Clusterer is an implementation of this Clusterer interface. So let's go there real quick. And all Clusterer does is define a point, and this is just a carrier class for um, you know, the, an X and Y coordinate pair and uh, a designation of which cluster that point is currently associated with. So in other words, this is kind of the raw data point that my algorithm operates over. And then it defines this other method down here called cluster, which takes a list of points and performs that k-means clustering that I described earlier. So if I go back to Dalvik then, you see that um, I over, you know, I implement the cluster method. Um, I have this other method down here, which is just computing the Cartesian distance between two points in a 2D plane. Um, but really the magic happens in this loop up here. So um, I initialize a bunch of variables to, you know, some sane value. But the loop that I want to focus on is this one here. Uh, you can see that this loop runs until I decide that the algorithm has converged. And, you know, this block here is really where the heart of the algorithm happens. And as you can see, it's pretty simple. For every point in my list, for every group, uh, or, you know, every cluster that I'm, that I'm processing, um, compute the distance between the current point and the current center of the group. 
and then see if that distance is less than the distance from the current point to the group it's currently associated with. So in other words, I'm just looking for the low watermark of the, uh, group of, the, of the centroid or mean of each group that the current point is closest to. In other words, if the point is uh, determined to be closer to the current group than it's the group that it's currently in, I update the information here to say that, okay, you're now in the new group that you're closest to. Um, after that, I just have a, you know, if it converged, if there was no data change, then that means that the algorithm is over and I can do an early break. And then in here, uh, I just have a block where I recompute the centroids um, as that last step before the next iteration. So that's it. This is a pretty straightforward, um, you know, algorithm. So let me run that for you. So I'll create a new launcher called K-means. and run this on my device, which I have here. And you can see in the background, Eclipse is, uh, is launching the activity. And then there it is running. Okay, autofocuser is having a little bit of trouble there, but you can see um, that what it's doing is um, up here, there's two numbers that are being drawn. The top number is the rendering time in milliseconds, and the bottom number is the uh, computation time in milliseconds. And the point that I want to make is that it renders actually really fast, on the order of 15 to 18 milliseconds. And that's the time it takes to physically draw 500 color-coded points on the screen. But the computation time here is quite clearly the bottleneck, on the order of you know, almost a second uh, in, in some cases. So that's it. That's the basic algorithm. This is the most boring implementation of this that you're going to see today. Um, consider it the baseline. So, <clears throat> so what are some examples of Dalvik apps in the real world? Um, well, the core system apps are all uh, Dalvik applications. Here you see the dialer. Um, and additionally, nearly all of the apps currently available on the market, such as uh, Google Sky Map, which you see on the right here, are also um, you know Android or excuse me, are also Dalvik applications. So, what are some of the things that we're going to be working on in the future for Dalvik apps? Uh, well, improved garbage collection. Um, as well as the team has also started work on a just-in-time compiler. Uh, and, uh, you know, as always, additional optimizations in the core library. So, you know, some of the libraries that are available to you will, will get faster over time. And then, of course, you know, we're not going to sit idle. Dalvik is the main place. It, it is the main embodiment of all of the device framework APIs. And so things like Bluetooth, uh, you know, peer-to-peer -peer networking and so on, these will start to appear in, uh, in, the, uh, in Dalvik APIs. So the next thing I want to do is talk about uh, web apps or AJAX apps uh, for a moment. So AJAX applications um, are characterized, or at least I like to think of them as being characterized as uh, really a separation of your UI and your um, appearance in the form of uh, you know, HTML and CSS and so on, your, your declarative layout um, as separate from the code that runs and mutates your layout. And so the, the general model here is that, um, you know, in an AJAX application, you have the browser running, you've specified a, a document tree in the appearance in HTML and CSS, and you're running some JavaScript code in the browser to, you know, mutate or change. You know, you add data, you remove data, you animate things, and so on. Um, you can do limited network access, at least in the old school way of doing AJAX, uh, via, you know, this notion of XML HTTP requests, which lets you issue requests back to your server to store data, read data, perform other operations, and so on. And then recently, there's this thing that, you know, obviously you guys saw quite a bit of in uh, the keynote this morning uh, about, you know, this Canvas tag that is relatively new. And this allows JavaScript to do something that it couldn't do before, which is direct painting. Um, now, in the keynote, uh, you might recall that uh, Vic mentioned, um, you know, he asked the question, how do you draw a diagonal line? Similarly, like, in the old school way of doing JavaScript, if you're all familiar with that programming model, you probably realize it would also be pretty difficult to do something as simple as draw 500 color-coded points on the screen. Fortunately, we have the canvas tag, and that gives us a lot more flexibility and power in uh, JavaScript applications than we had before. So what about Ajax specifically on Android? Um, so these are notes on Android 1.5, which is the current version um, that is uh, being distributed to users worldwide. Um, the browser in Android is based on WebKit, and currently it's based on the Squirrelfish uh, JavaScript virtual machine. Um, the, uh, the specific version of WebKit is equivalent to Safari 4 beta, but oops, <laughs> due to a bug in the browser code in 1.5, it's actually still reporting as Safari 3.1.2. So you've got all of the Safari 4 beta um, functionality and speed and so on. We're just misreporting the, the user agent string. 
Um, it does include gears, uh, 0517, which is uh, one of the more recent gears builds, including uh, geolocation support. Um, and then, of course, it does include support for that Canvas tag that I mentioned earlier, and in fact, has included that uh, even since version 1.0. Well, what can you do with this? Well, you know, it's a state-of-the-art browser, and so it's really good at rendering static pages if that's really what you want to do. Um, but we're here to talk about applications which are quite a bit more dynamic than just static pages. Uh, and so, you know, you can do anything that you can do um, in, you know, a desktop browser on Android. Um, you know, you can fetch data. And then, of course, the big issue is, you know, HTML5. I hope you guys are excited by some of the stuff you saw in the keynote. Um, all that is coming to, uh, you know, Dolv or excuse me, it's coming to Android over time in the browser. Um, right now, we've got gears. That's what you can start coding to today. And over time, we'll, we'll uh, shift over to HTML5. Um, but, yeah, I mean, in HTML5 lets you do everything that you'd like to be able to do. You can access your location. You can run code out of band in the background, store pages and data locally and everything. Um, so I mentioned this earlier. You know, Android does not currently have HTML5. It has elements of it. Over time, we're going to be adding more elements. Um, and in the meantime, you can use gears. Um, but the big things that you can't do, uh, even with this model on Android, are things like background processing. And what I mean there is if the browser is not running at all, um, you know, any application that was, would normally run in your uh, browser page context is not executing. And so that does limit what you can do to some extent, uh, you know, with an AJAX application. The other thing that you can't do is you can't access the system and framework APIs. Um, you know, so things like, you know, OpenGL, uh, you know, some of the networking APIs, the ability to open arbitrary TCP IP sockets. You can't do these things through a strict um, AJAX application by default. So hold that thought. I'll come back to that later. So what I want to do now is show you a quick demo of the same algorithm that I showed you earlier, but this time uh, implemented as, you know, in a browser application. So this is uh, this browser that I'm running here with... Uh, I believe that's Cutman up there, is uh, uh, Safari 4, one of the betas. So what I want to do is go to this URL. Um, this is a plain old, uh, you, can, you can enter that URL into your own browser if you want. It's just a plain old App Engine instance that I'm using uh, to, as a convenient way to store some files. Um, so this is, uh, let me just rerun this a few times, and you can see that you know, this is also doing the same thing, you know, here, uh, the same algorithm, you know, yellow here, green here, purple, blue, orange, red. It's the exact same behavior as you just saw running on the device over here, but done in a desktop browser. Um, the first thing I want to do is point out these speeds. Again, th those same numbers are the same ones that you just saw here. Nine milliseconds drawing time and six milliseconds computation time. This is a state-of-the-art browser you know, on a desktop, you know, running at, I don't even know how fast these things are, these MacBooks. Another thing I want to do, though, is run this. You know, I, I also have installed on my Mac here a, uh, an early build of Chromium. Um, and you can see here that this is also screamingly fast. So these are, you know, the state-of-the-art desktop browsers. And that's the first point I want to draw, or the first distinction that I want to make. And just point this out to you guys. You know, phones, it doesn't matter what kind of a phone it is or what operating system it's running. Phones are slow, and that isn't going to change for a long time. You know, they're fast enough so that the user interface can feel smooth and fluid and so on, but when it comes right down to it, a lot of what you do is just not ever going to be as fast for a long time on one of these things as it is on one of these things. And I'm not trying to say that to dissuade you or anything like that. All I'm doing is just trying to make sure that everybody understands that, you know, these are much, you know, more limited hardware than a desktop, and not to fall into the trap of thinking that, you know, one size fits all. You've got to understand your application. If speed is important to your app, this is something that you should maybe think about. Um, at any rate, what I want to do now is show you the source code for this thing. Um, so this is the actual HTML page. And as you can see, it's super, super simple. Um, I have a canvas element with an ID of k-means. I have a div, which is this thing at the bottom where I draw um, or where I display the, the execution times. And then here I just call the single JavaScript function uh, called draw. And it's defined in this external file that I include called kmeans.js. So this is just a, you know, straight up JavaScript code. Um, you can see that I you know, allocate some variables and constants up here. I have, again, an implementation as a separate function of that Cartesian uh, distance uh, function. And here's, again, the, uh, you know, the, the cluster algorithm where the, where the heart of the code goes on. Uh, again, a block up front of just initializing variables. And here again is that main loop. 
This should look a little familiar. Um, this is literally a direct transcription of the same code from Java into JavaScript. And you can see here, you know, for every point, for every group, compute the distance between the current point and the current group. And if that distance is less than the distance to the, you know, point's current group, update the information and say, you now belong to the new group. I have the same early, you know, loop break. I have the same uh, centroid calculation, you know, as the last step in the iteration. And again, I have the same, um, you know, early breakout after 15 iterations. Um, this reset function, uh, one thing I didn't mention about the Dalvik version is that when you run this, it's actually starting by um, eliminating or basically regenerating all of the input points to be a uh, completely random set of input. And so that's what this uh, reset function does. There's an equivalent method in the Dalvik version you saw earlier called prepare. And then the final thing is this uh, draw algorithm. Now what I want to do is actually, if I can do this, show these side by side. Um, because I think this is really cool. Uh, where's the thread? I do not have the thread open. So the... Okay, here's the draw method in uh, the Dalvik version. Okay, so, you know, again, we do some initialization. We call the cluster algorithm. But this is really down here, the loop, where the actual work gets done uh, in terms of drawing. And you can see here that in the JavaScript version, using Canvas, we get a handle to a context that we can actually draw on. Um, and then we come down to the loop and we just say, okay, well, your current uh, fill style, which is really the drawing properties, is a black, uh, pure black um, color. And all I do is I just draw a rectangle encompassing the entire canvas. And um, in other words, that creates the black background. And then on top of that, I draw um, each point in turn um, color-coded you know, via the cluster that it currently belongs in. And that is astonishingly, at least to me, similar to the Dalvik version, where um, instead of, in the, you know, where the JavaScript version actually has you set those drawing properties on the Canvas object itself, in Dalvik there's actually just a separate uh, container class for that that, that, that uh, encapsulates all the drawing properties called paint. But other than that, it's strikingly similar. Um, I do a draw ARGB, which basically blanks the screen, um, and then I draw a... Uh, a point in this case, and in JavaScript Canvas, all you can draw is a rectangle with, you know, dimensions of one by one. Um, but in, uh, in Dalvik, you can actually just draw a point. But, you know, again, it's the same thing. I just pick each point by the color of the cluster it's in. So these are very, very similar, um, you know, drawing schemes or, or paradigms. So what I want to do now then is switch back over to um, the device and run this. So I'm launching the browser. And hopefully it picked it up from uh, my browser history correctly. Oh, I'm on edge. Okay, so there it was. It just loaded the pure JavaScript version. And there again, you know, it's, it's very similar to the display that you just saw on the desktop. But what I want to call your attention to down here is these rendering times. 334 milliseconds for, uh, for drawing and 698 milliseconds for the clustering uh, computation. So, you know, on the whole, it's a little bit, uh, it's pretty comparable in performance to Dalvik, although perhaps a little bit slower. But that rendering time is, you know, or at least can be for many applications, that rendering time can be quite problematic. Um, and again, just compare that to the desktop. You know, it's the exact same JavaScript code but it's running something on the order of 10 or 20 times faster on the desktop than it is on one of these things. Again, I'm not trying to dissuade you. Just be aware of that as you, as you design your applications. Okay, so that was an Ajax demo. You know, what are some examples of this? Well, you know, you saw some earlier today. The Google Reader, which is one of my favorite uh, web applications. Uh, you know, the Google Mail client that you guys have seen. There's, you know, obviously a, a number of different uh, web applications that have been de developed for a certain uh, fruit-flavored phone out there. Um, uh, so, you know, what's going to come in the future? Well, HTML5 is not going to sit still. You know, you guys saw the, the future of web technologies in general, and, and hopefully many of these things will start to become standardized and get rolled into HTML5. 
specifically for Android Gears today, HTML5 tomorrow. Um, the team is already working on, uh, the browser team is working on upgrading to a faster JavaScript virtual machine. You guys may be aware there's kind of three out there. There's uh, Trace Monkey by Firefox, Squirrelfish Extreme, um, that Safari is using in V8, which is what uh, Google's using in Chrome. You know, and, and you know, they're looking at whether we can pull any of these three into the browser and increase uh, JavaScript performance even more. You know, and then, you know, as for the other things you saw, like O3D, um, you know, the 3D technology that, you know, currently operates as a browser plugin, things like that, you know, who knows? It's, it's, it's likely that they'll probably, you know, trail the mobile space because the first thing they need to get standardized and then mobile, you know, platforms need to implement them. But, you know, the future is bright uh, and uh, it's pretty exciting, at least to me. Now, I want to take one last moment. I asked you earlier to hold, hold a thought. And that thought was, um, you know, if you've got an AJAX application, you can't necessarily get access to a lot of the core framework APIs. Well, there's this, I, one thing that you can do. Here I'm showing a, a Dalvik virtual machine, and this would be a standard, you know, Android application. Contained in that are a bunch of Java objects that are communicating with each other uh, and so on. Um, also in this uh, virtual machine, in, as part of the view tree, is this uh, notion that we have of a, of a web view. Now, a web view is, is literally just a WebKit component wrapped up in the semantics of an Android view, and it allows you to pull HTML rendering embedded into your application UI along with other widgets. Uh, but we also have this other uh, interesting little method that we've added called add JavaScript interface. I'm going to talk about this a bit more later, but really what this does is it lets you turn a standard AJAX application into like a super AJAX application, or what I like to call augmented AJAX. Um, and what it really does is it lets you inject functionality into your uh, JavaScript code. I'm going to demo this, but I'm going to demo this a little bit later. So I'm going to ask you again to, to hold that thought and come back to it. Um, so the third uh, kind of key way of developing applications for Android is this notion of native code. What is this for? Um, well, it generally, you know, native code is for doing heavy lifting. Um, this is a, a component that you can kind of pull into an existing or pull into a Dalvik application. But really, the Dalvik uh, virtual machine is the one running the show. It's the, it's the, the code that gets started and starts running, uh, loads up you know, a, the appropriate chunk of native code, and then starts making calls into it via the Java native interface. Um, to do this, you need a native uh, tool chain, including um, you know, like a GCC cross compiler and so on, so that you can actually compile C or C++ code into a, uh, you know, an, an ARM ELF shared library that you can run on the device. So a work in progress, uh, what we call Native Development Kit, or NDK, which is a companion or complement to the standard SDK that you guys are already familiar with, uh, we recently uh, added one to the, the donut branch in uh, the public Git repository. Um, so what I'm going to do a little later is going to demo an early kind of interim build for that thing, and I'll talk more about that later. So what is this thing for? Well, it's really for physics and mathematical simulations. Um, this k-means clustering algorithm that I'm showing you guys is a great example. Um, it's also for you know fast loading of, of largest data files. So, you know, if you've got like a really massive, say, XML document or some binary file or something like that, and you know parsing it in Java is too memory intensive or too slow, um, you know you can write C code instead and and uh, you know do the heavy lifting that way. Um, another common use of this is for input management engines, um, i.e. on-screen keyboards. And, you know, these are for things like text prediction and so on. You know, users are sitting there typing away furiously on this thing. If you really, really, really need uh, a fast lookup, you know, this is a, a case where you might use that. Other things are custom virtual machines, you know, for things like obsolete games and so on. Um, and there's also, of course, other things you can do there. You know, you can run, you know, it's just native code, it's running. It can see in the process, you know, address space, all kinds of other libraries. Um, the issue with using them isn't so much whether you can use them, but whether you should use them. Um, and this is the same story that we tell even when you're writing Dalvik code. We have public APIs or supported APIs and then unsupported APIs. And these are the ones that are internal to the framework that we don't guarantee consistency on that can change over time. And that problem you know, is obviously a difficulty for developers. If you use one of these you know, frameworks in your, in your Dalvik code and we change that API, Someday a user is going to get, you know, an over-the-air update to their device and, you know, their favorite application, your application is just going to stop working because you're using an unsupported API. That's a big problem for you guys. It's a big problem for us. Uh, and the problem actually gets to be quite a bit worse, um, you know, if you use native code because not only can we uh, change the API for some of these um, libraries that aren't public, we can actually change the binary structure of them as well, which can also break it, even if the API is the same. 
So in other words, don't use, you know, don't fall to the temptation of using other native APIs in there unless you're willing to accept the extremely huge risks that go along with that of having your app break on a future version. Um, so what can't you do? Well, I just mentioned this earlier. Currently, the only APIs that we're guaranteeing or that we plan to guarantee stability for are LibM, which is the math library, and LibC, which is the standard C library. Um, we do have plans to add more over time, but right now the focus is on uh, getting that early NDK that I just mentioned. We're trying to get that polished up for release, hopefully in the next few weeks. Um, and so we'll add more over time, but for the first version, those are the only ones we're planning to support. The other thing that you can't do um, is hack the system. Uh, this native code thing that I'm going to show you does not represent you know, necessarily anything new. There's no special privileges to native code. It's still subject to the same sandboxing limitations as you know, all the other code that runs on an Android device. Um, so there's no additional security risk or security burden imposed by using native code uh, in an application. So now what I want to do is uh, show you guys a quick demo. So I'm going to come over here um, and uh, show you this directory. So this is, as I mentioned earlier, this is an early build of the, uh, uh, the native development kit. You can actually do this yourself if you go to the, check out the donut branch from the public Git repository and go through the work of building your own cross compiler, um, you know, for whatever your host platform is to arm, uh, you know, the appropriate arm family and so on. So you can actually get this, but I have kind of a uh, preliminary build here. And the way that this currently works is there's two directories. There's this apps directory and this sources directory. Under the apps directory, uh, HDICT is how do I code the, um, there's this one file called application.make, uh, which really just defines an entry for um, my code to be compiled and run. Uh, and you can see here that I set the destination directory to be the directory where my, uh, my current uh, Eclipse project lives. And then this is the name of the, the specific library that I compile, and then some C flags that I can set. The other directory is the sources directory. Um, and this is where the actual C code lives. And so here I have in this native cluster.c file uh, and this android.mk file, which really just tell it how to build. Um, this is, has documentation, so I'm not going to go into the innards of how this works. But basically, you just run make um, app equals and then the name of the app. Um, actually, I already built it recently, so I have to... Uh, and so then it runs a compile and then drops the resulting .so file into my uh, directory here. So if I come back here and then check out this libs directory, you'll see that I now have a directory uh, with, this, with, the dynamic, with the dynamically loadable uh, shared library in this new directory corresponding to the, to the current uh, processor family. So that's how I get the actual native code. Now, how do I actually use it? Um, and so for that, I actually have another file in that directory, which is this file here, native cluster.java. And so if I, whoops. So if I drag this and include this in my project, now you see why I created this cluster interface. Um, over here in uh, the k-means view, um, I'm basically just doing a dependency injection here. I have an interface cluster that knows how to implement a clustering algorithm in some way, shape, or form. Uh, and at first, I just used the Dalvik version of it. But now that I have this new native implementation, I can change that over to a native clusterer. And if I look at this actual file, you'll see that um, incredibly simple. All I do is, is a static initializer, load the specific library that I want to load, um, and then uh, you know I have a, a method um, cluster that in this case is declared native, and then that's handled by the C code. So let's check out that C code. So here again, um, you can see that I have, again, that same Cartesian distance calculator. I have a struct instead of a class for holding the point x, y coordinates in the current cluster assignment. Um, and then here, really, it's just the same function that you've seen before. I have a block uh, here, which is the you know, uh, variable initialization. Uh, and then again, the main loop. And once again, this should look pretty familiar. You know, until I converge for every point, um, for every uh, cluster, compute the distance. You know, if, if, I'm if the current point now belongs to a new group, 
you know, update the assignments. The only thing that's new here um, are really a few things such as here where I cache some uh, JNI objects and this is just for performance so I'm not constantly doing a lookup uh, in, the, in the middle of a tight loop. And then in here, I basically, this is like a field dereference in uh, you know, JNI parlance. And then of course I just have to do this additional step of making sure that I keep track of uh, you know, garbage collected references so I don't overload the virtual machine. Um, and then so down here I have, um, again, the same uh, centroid recalculation block. Now, there's one thing I want to point out about this. Um, you guys are probably familiar with the fact that in C, you typically don't have the same kind of rich uh, class libraries that you have in, say, uh, Java or JavaScript. So in the original version of the Dalvik and, and Ajax versions, I actually had a bunch of you know, cache maps and object associative arrays that I was using. And you know, well, these things are fast, right? You know, they've been out for a long time, and they're well optimized. In fact, they are. But in C, I didn't have access to anything like that. So what I did was I just kind of refactored the algorithm to um, uh, basically be a flat array-based structure instead of having to use hash maps. Um, I also flattened an inner loop. When I did that, you know, I said, okay, that, I got it working in C. I'm like, well, it's not going to make any difference really, but I'm going to go back and refactor uh, JavaScript and Java to use the same model so that I had an apples-to-apples -apples comparison. Five times faster in both Java uh, source running in Dalvik and JavaScript. So... I was kind of surprised by that, but really what it means again is just another example. You know, these things, I'm not going to belabor this point because you can go to Jeff Sharkey's uh, talk, um, I think later today, on, uh, you know, battery life and performance. But, you know, these things are just not fast. And, you know, a, a little change like that probably wouldn't matter much on a desktop, but it matters a huge amount on a mobile. So um, when I did that, you know, the C version that you see here kind of became the canonical version of, of my algorithm. Um, aside from that, it uses the exact same rendering kind of pipeline and rendering structure as the, uh, you know, the pure Dalvik version. So let me run this again. So it's installing it in the background. Fires it up. And you can see there that it's running a lot faster. Um, in fact, you can see that you know, the rendering is taking about the same amount of time, but now I'm down to like 200 milliseconds. Um, I think I've actually got something else going on on my device at the moment because it usually runs at about 150 milliseconds for, um, you know, for the actual uh, calculation uh, cycle. So obviously quite a bit faster as expected. Okay, so <clears throat> switching back to the slides again. So, you know, what are some examples of what you can do with this? Well, um, one of my personal favorites is this thing called ScumVM, uh, which is using, or which is an implementation of, uh, you know, a LucasArts game engine so that you can play classic games. And before you ask, yes, I actually do have a license to Zach McCracken. Um, one of my most cherished software licenses, in fact. Um, some of our, you know, partners, Spotify, are also using uh, this technique um, to do some of their... Um, uh, low-level, uh, you know, music-related, uh, you know, encryption calculations. Unfortunately, I forgot to get a screenshot of them. So sorry about that. Um, so what's up uh, for the future of this technique? Well, as I mentioned earlier, um, you know, we're interested in adding additional libraries, but, you know, right now we're focused on, you know, polishing this thing up and, and trying to get this out there for you guys as a, you know, standard tool that you can use as a complement to the SDK. So we haven't really, uh, you know, established what's going to come in the future. But one thing I do want to stress is we have no plans to make this sort of a separate application stack. The model that you just saw where Dalvik starts and handles most of the event logic and so on and calls out to, to C code, that's the model that we're going to be uh, focusing on. Um, and what I mean by a separate event stack is, is things like, you know, you know, are you going to be able to write an application that's entirely in C and never starts a Dalvik virtual machine? And the answer to that is no. We think that over time, you know, the optimizations that we're making to the core Dalvik libraries will make it even more compelling than it is today. And that, you know, this will make for a nice uh, balance between those two programming models. Um, so now I want to do a bonus demo. I promised you a demo of something earlier. So let me come back here to Eclipse. And in fact, to Finder as well. So I have this site that I showed you earlier. And I have another file here called uh, index2.html. So if I load this, it does, wait, this did nothing. Why did this do nothing? Um, 
Well, what it, it did nothing because, and this is the source for the page, um, you get down to this point, this line here, and it crashed because, you know, what is this cluster object in, in all capitals? I don't know what that, what that is. So let me, you know, show you, uh, you know, what's going on here. So I have this new file here called k-means web view activity. So I'm going to drop this into my project. The other thing I'm going to do is um, add this new layout to my project called alternate. And so you'll see that, you know, the web view activity actually relies on that alternate um, layout file to, uh, to do its drawing. So let me show you this code. If anybody can tell me how to get rid of these properties and outline tabs permanently, I would be forever in your debt. Um, but uh, so here is um, the, the new activity I just added. Again, this is a new screen in the application. It's going to do some different, different kind of work. Um, and so here I have this, this mysterious object class called cluster proxy, cluster or clusterer proxy. And it has a method called cluster, and I'll come back to that. So this is where, again, the, you know, the initialization occurs. Um, I set the, I, I specify that this new alternate view is going to be my current view. Um, and let's look at that real quick. Uh, in contrast to the first one of these I showed you, which was entirely a, um, you know, custom view, like the entire screen was occupied by a custom view. In this case, the entire screen is occupied by one of these web views that's included with, with the Android. Um, so then what I do is I grab a handle to that web view, and then um, I enable JavaScript on it, and then I do this interesting little line here, and this is that method I alluded to earlier, add JavaScript interface. What this is doing is it's injecting an instance of this cluster um, proxy into the JavaScript namespace under the name cluster. So what that means is if I go back to this thing, um, when you run this on an Android, when you run this app on an Android device, it's actually injected um, a Java object with you know, appropriate shim stuff going on into the uh, JavaScript namespace for JavaScript code to actually make calls on. Um, in this case, all it's doing is uh, implementing the um, cluster, uh, the k-means clustering algorithm. So I scroll up here. Um, and look at this mysterious cluster object, you can see that um, all I do is I do some data formatting to get the data from JavaScript in a form that I can use it. I run the Dalvik cluster on it, and then I kind of do some formatting of the results and throw that back up to JavaScript. So let me run this for you. Oh, and of course, I forgot to, I need to add it to the uh, Android manifest first. Run this on my device, switch back to the... So starting it up, and this is going to look a lot like the, uh, the web version, like the pure Ajax version. Except that what it's actually doing, again, because I'm trapped on edge, it looks like, it's actually downloading the thing, and this time it actually worked on the Android browser. Um, so I actually, you can't really read the text at the bottom, and it's, it's backwards anyway. Um, but to relaunch this, all I have to do is just quit and uh, rerun it. And there it is again. Um, yeah, I wish I could get it to focus on the numbers there. Okay. So, in other words, what I just did was I injected, um, you know, the Dalvik cluster version of the clustering algorithm into the code. But, now I warn you, what I'm about to do, I believe this to be banned in 49 of the U.S. states, and most Western religions will excommunicate you if you do this. But what I'm actually going to do is uh, switch this over and use the native cluster, and then rerun this application. So, in other words, what this is actually doing is this is starting in JavaScript, you know, that's where the code is running, 
And instead of you know, executing the cluster algorithm in JavaScript, it's calling to Dalvik, which is calling to, through JNI down to C code. So I'm actually uh, you know, running um, you know, this code. Well, you can't see that because I didn't switch to the view. But I'm actually running this um, using the native version. So you can actually see the text there this time. And it's at 589 milliseconds. Um, it actually was at approximately you know, one second or, or 1.2 seconds in the previous version. So in other words, what I did was I basically just took the native version of the code and accessed that from JavaScript. So if you think about that, though, there's more to this than just <clears throat> native code. Um, that class, that cluster or proxy object, can do anything. It can talk to the location API. It can fire intents in the system. Really what this represents is a way to augment your AJAX applications so that you can get access to the rest of the system. And this is, um, that's why we call this technique, or I call this technique augmented AJAX. Um, so now I just kind of want to wrap up and say, how do you actually choose what you, what you want to do? Um, so here's a table. And first, I want to focus on the middle column. First, look at the Dalvik and the native versions. They have the same rendering time, which you would expect, since it's the same rendering pipeline. Um, JavaScript, though, um, and, and these results, by the way, are the average of uh, 10 trials of, you know, for each of these numbers um, when there was nothing else running on the device. So um, the JavaScript version, which is to say the Canvas version, runs at 303 milliseconds. Um, now, that's not slow by any stretch of the imagination. Um, obviously, it's much slower than uh, a desktop equivalent, and it's uh, you know, quite a bit slower than the native code rendering pipeline available to Dalvik. Um, but for most human user interactions, that's just fine. And also drawing 500 you know, one by one rectangles to a, a canvas is not a common operation. So you know, what this means is that you know, your takeaway here should not be that you, um, that, that, sh that should be the canvas is slow, but really just that uh, understand what your application needs. You know, perhaps another way to look at this data is in the third column where I say the percent of, of rendering time. Um, the rendering time takes about a third of the execution time of the JavaScript version, but it takes, you know, depending on whether you're running, you know, with or without native assistance, between two and ten or two and twelve percent of the total execution time uh, for the other models. But again, this doesn't mean that it's slow in any absolute sense. It just means understand your application. If you're doing a lot of computation, um, you know, maybe you want to look into, do into native code. If you're, you know, just doing a lot of UI updates, you know, maybe you can go ahead and use the JavaScript version. Um, so, you know, I, I told you earlier that I wasn't going to, you know, give you a, a, a formula or anything, but instead I'll give you this flowchart. So if, you, if you're deciding how to build an application, uh, you know, for Android, first you ask yourself, do you have an existing website that you want to integrate with? If the answer is yes, well, the next question is, well, is that an AJAX site, meaning that, you know, are you all, do you already have, like, a dynamic user interface? Um, if the answer is yes, then you've probably already implemented it as something like a REST service. Um, if you haven't, Wait, if you haven't, why are you in this room? Like, why, why is your site not Ajaxy right now? You know, go to one of the other sessions later today and learn how to build a, a really cool, you know, Ajax-enabled site. Um, and so you're going to come back to a REST service anyway. If you don't have an existing website, and we've determined that if you do, it's going to be a REST site, um, you know, and if you, and if you need a website, then, you know, you should go ahead and build it as a REST. But, you know, at this point, you know, the next question is like, well, what does your app actually do? Does your app need to be really fast? If it doesn't, you know, in the sense, and by really fast, I mean, like, does it do a lot of rendering or does it, you know, do a lot of cal computation? If it's just a plain old app, Ajax may work fine for you. If it does need to be fast, I'm not sure I believe you yet, but if you do say it needs to be really fast, then okay, go ahead and use native code. If you don't, if you, you know, if it doesn't really need to be screamingly fast, then yeah, that's what I thought. Go ahead and use Dalvik. So, but wait, no, if you do use Ajax, then there's another sort of ancillary question. Do you want to have the ability to interact, you know, in, a, in, in fancy pants ways with notifications and so on? In which case, if you do, you might need to use Dalvik or use this augmented AJAX technique that I showed you earlier. You know, but then there's kind of an all-important question of, you know, wait, well, what languages do you even know? If you don't know JavaScript, you don't want to learn it. Is AJAX even an option for you? You know, so your options are C, C++, Java, you know, JavaScript, and, you know, these will go back to one of the other models. It's like, you know, haven't we, you know, seen this somewhere before? You know, and, and so, you know, really the point here, I, I'm making a joke, but at, in the end, you know, what this basically boils down to is go, you know, with what you know. There's more than one way to go. There's more than one way to do this. You know, we're not trying to tell you that there's, you know, one correct way to build applications. The way that we want you to think of this is that, you know, the centroid, in a way, of your application can be anywhere. It can be primarily Dalvik. It can be primarily Ajax. It can, you know, have a large component in, in native code. 
and you can pull in components from any you know, methodology or any aspect of the, of the environment that you want. You know, Dalvik apps can embed web uh, views, web apps can call into Dalvik, um, you know, apps can include native pieces. And really what it boils down to is understand your application. You know, there's nothing wrong with you know, wanting to use Dalvik just because you know Java. There's nothing wrong with wanting to reuse your Ajax site because you know JavaScript really well and you're, an, you're a JavaScript ninja. Um, and so, you know, again, just understand the characteristics of your app, know what you want to build, um, and go with what you know. So that's it. That's all the material that I had for you today. Um, and I'm happy to take any questions. There are two microphones here. I guess we've only got just a few minutes left. So uh, uh, thanks for your time, and I appreciate you coming. So if you have a question, uh, please head up to one of the microphones so that uh, everybody can hear the recording session. Um, just real quick, uh, what's the cost of the JNI piece? So when you're calling out? That's a great question, and I actually didn't measure that. So I didn't, I didn't measure like, you know, the time before the call and the time in the call and the time return. Um, it would actually, if you want to check out the source code there, uh, that URL, um, it would actually be very easy to modify my code to, to get those numbers, but I didn't specifically run that test. Hi, Dan. Uh, What's the memory limitation for the processor? Is it still 16 megabytes if you invoke the native code, or you can exceed that? Uh, that's a good question, actually. I'm not entirely sure what the answer to that is. 16, OK, yeah, it's enforced at 16 megabytes per process, my colleague says. And the Java system available memory will report that memory of a native code? Or? So the Dalvik will report the memory that is known to Dalvik, um, but you can use the standard uh, you know, Linux tools to see what the total process memory usage is. Thank you. Question over here. I have a question for you. Um, <clears throat> before, what you were doing was uh, you were doing all the computation in native code, but then you were actually drawing back in Dalvik. Do you have any plans to extend this so that we can actually just blit from native code or draw natively? An excellent question. Um, you know, we're certainly aware that uh, that's something that people want to be able to do. But you know, as I said earlier, for now we're focused on getting this thing uh, launched with you know some basic uh, you know tools and so on, and you know we'll work on adding additional APIs like the ability to draw and so on uh, in a future version, perhaps. But if you want to hear it, please by all means join our developer forum and let us know. All right, thanks. Question here. Uh, you mentioned that um, NDK will be available in Donut uh, branch, but it's also there in Cupcake. Will it be supported in Cupcake? And that's correct. In fact. Um, the, what this basically boils down to is this one method call called system.load library. Uh, system.load library existed in an Android 1.0. You can already do this. The only thing that's new is the ability to um, have a tool chain. Uh, there's two things that are new. The, the tool chain that is pre-built and, and compiles your C code down to native code and the guarantee of a, of a couple libraries, in this case libm and libc, that, will, that are guaranteed to be present in a particular format. So those are the guarantees that you didn't have before. From a technology perspective, you can already do this. From a you know, practical, you know, should you do this perspective, until now, you haven't been able to do it. But yes, um, we, we are hoping to be able to release this NDK for uh, Android 1.5, even though it's in the donut uh, branch. Thank you. Hey. Uh, what is the extent of support that you are planning to provide in native code? Uh, so uh, tomorrow, will I be able to create an activity from the native code? No, um, we don't plan to, the, the core of the application stack will still be driven from Dalvik. So like, you know, that will handle all the event processing, application lifecycle, startup, teardown, and so on. No. Um, native code will remain just a, a chunk of code that you can make calls into through JNI. Yeah, uh, I agree with that, but uh, suppose I start with the Dalvik. Uh, the initial activity is created by the Dalvik, but later on, if I want to create multiple activities from the native code for the same application, Oh, so are you asking if you have like a thread uh, and you call and you want to like a thread running in native code and you want to call into a Dalvik class? Is that what you're asking? Uh, yeah. Uh, I actually don't think we've thought that far ahead yet. Um, another thing that it would be great to hear your feedback about use cases and so on on our developer forum. Okay. Thank you. I think I'm out of time, so uh, I want to wrap up uh, again, and I'll be around. So be around all day today and tomorrow. So I look forward to speaking with many of you. Thanks.